morning, everybody. Uh, we are an international uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we're based out of Belgium, as was mentioned. Uh, the way we are funded is by all the companies, universities, end users, and so on around the world that want to see the FTT standard continue to be developed and advanced. So the FTT standard has its roots uh, in the FTT organization. Uh, we were the ones then that took it to the IEC committee, so it's now an international IEC standard, IEC 62453. It's also a number of other uh, regional standards as well. So our job now is we continue to maintain the standard, add new features to it. We just released a new s version of the standard called FTT2. And then we market the standard around the world so that end users like you are aware of its capabilities and uh, also work with the manufacturers to make sure that they have the features, capabilities, and tools that they need to integrate it into their product line as well. Okay, so a little bit about how the FTT standard came to be. Um, you know, I think you're all involved in automation projects in one form or another, and we're aware that the environment really gets more and more complex as time goes on. Uh, the projects get bigger, the number of devices in them uh, grow. Probably what's more notable is the number of device manufacturers that can exist now in a single project. I think gone are the days where it was a one vendor trying to deliver everything. And now many core capabilities, some uh, real critical functionality come in from these unique vendors that get integrated into a larger system. So by nature, you're often now dealing with more and more vendors in a given installation. And I think the device types are going up too. My experience, I've been in the automation industry for 25 years, and you can see that the just the scope of devices and the kinds of things that can be measured, recorded, controlled, and so on continues to go up over the years. It's certainly not going down. And then if, if networking has done anything for us, it's actually driven up the number of IOs that are in most installations. And I think that's largely because it becomes easier. You know, before we worried about how big the central cabinet was going to be and how we could distribute IO. Now with many of the networks that are out there, distributed IO is a no-brainer. You put the IO right in the area that you need to capture it and home run with the network. You don't worry about the unique issues with PLCs or DCSs about how you're going to wire those things up. So certainly our automation scope continues to grow and become more complex. And this multi-vendor reality was one of the things that really got the FTT standard started, was that as these vendors worked on projects, the reality was it was very difficult to integrate all these different products into a single project scope. And even if you happen to get a few of the manufacturers written into somebody's DCS or somebody's unique PLC system, by the very next application, something else was incompatible. So it was really an unsustainable environment. And it comes down to you, the end users, then either didn't get the solutions that you really wanted, or you didn't get best in class devices before a standard like FTT came along. So the current plant landscape is perhaps even a little bit more complicated by the fact there are so many networks out there. And this slide by no means represents the scope of all the potential networks. But I think it's fair to say that it's not at all unusual anymore to see a multi-network environment actually engineered from the ground up that way. It used to be that you got multi-network environments just by staying around long enough in one plant you know, you had built part of the plant with this network, and then maybe part of the facility with this network, and so on, and pretty soon you were dealing with multiple networks. Now you can actually plan projects up front where you take advantage of some particular network. Uh, if you happen to do motion control applications in your environment, there are networks that are very well suited to high-speed motion control, whereas other networks are really well suited to very inexpensive remote I.O. capabilities. So there's an advantage to being able to pick those networks. Now, one of the misconceptions sometimes about the FTT standard is that we're another network standard, and we're not at all. We play with all of the networks that are out there in the industry. That's our job. We make those all interoperate through our standard. So we don't add another network on it. 
we just make sure that all the networks that are out there that you as the end user want to use in your solution work seamlessly with the FTP standard. So with all of that being said, this is maybe the way you as an end user would look if it weren't for a standard like the FTP standard. If every vendor developed and delivered some kind of configuration tool and said, here's my CD for how you calibrate my particular instrument, or here's my CD on how you calibrate it, or here's my memory stick with the drivers that you need for that particular PLC, and then there's another memory stick for this GPS and so on. These were the days of configuration, calibration, commissioning prior to the FTP standard. You could literally end up with a desk drawer full of CDs, DVDs, floppies, you name it, to try to keep that thing all operating. So FTP standard was then really commissioned with the concept that it would cover the entire life cycle of doing either process automation applications or factory automation applications. And that scope of life cycle includes the commissioning, operating, maintaining, diagnosing, calibrating, and so on. And you'll see much of that today in the live demonstration uh, with the products that are here using the FTP standard. So who really then benefits from this FTP standard? I mean, clearly from a manufacturer's perspective, there's great benefit out there. The people that have to make all these instruments, devices, remote IOs, network gateways, and so on, have the great advantage that now they don't have to run around and try to figure out how they integrate with everybody else and write a whole bunch of custom code for every unique vendor that they interface with. That's the way it used to be just 10 years ago. If you wanted to be able to play on all the DCSs in the world, you had to go and sit down with each DCS vendor and write some custom code with them. If they'd even let you do that to get the devices to work. So those days are gone. So all the device manufacturers can now participate with an open standard and not be at all concerned about where it's going to integrate, just know that it is going to integrate thanks to the FTP standard. Then from a host system perspective, the same situation applies. These are the guys that have the big software applications that are doing the control environment. So that could be a DCS distributed control system. It could be a PLC manufacturer. It could be a little narrower scope. It could be asset management activities, calibration, handhelds, engineering tools, you name it. All those software applications that need to talk with all those different devices, all those intelligent devices, those people benefit from the standard as well because it's the standard that tells those devices, those big systems, how to talk with all the devices that are out there in the application. And then finally, you as end users are probably the largest beneficiary of all. The early work gets done at the DCS people, the PLCs, and the device manufacturers, but you're the beneficiary. You get to choose best in class devices for your application. If you need a particular kind of flow measurement that's very unique, you can find a device manufacturer that makes the right flow instrument for that particular application and select it. As long as they support the FTP standard, it'll all play together. Similarly, you can now be a little bit more selective on PLCs and other things that before it was a one vendor or nothing solution. You can now pick best in class at that level. And you can also add things that you couldn't get from one vendor in the past. So for example, many times in a factory automation application, the PLC people don't always have an asset management application that's going to take care of calibration, health of networks, things like that. You can go add that on now to your architecture as long as it supports the FTP standard. So you get this great benefit of freely mixing your environment and picking best in class devices. So some of the user requirements that were set forth was this freedom of choice. We always call that best in class. You can pick the manufacturers that best fit your particular application. Your investment's protected. One of the things we locked in to the founding documents of the FTP organization was that we were always to be backwards compatible. So while our standard will always move forward, new features, new capabilities, just because the standard moved forward doesn't mean you have to throw out everything in your facility and start over. You can 
have backwards compatibility with everything that's installed and then just gradually move forward to take advantage of the new features and so on. Uh, we're completely independent of all protocols. So you can peer through networks and talk to devices. You can position an FTP-based application nearly anywhere in the architecture and communicate freely with the devices that exist in that architecture. And I'll show you some of that in just a minute. And then finally, ease of use. This whole concept of it's available throughout the life cycle of the facility, uh, you'll see that come true not only in what we'll talk about briefly here this morning, but as you get a chance to actually see the live demonstrations, I think that'll become very clear to you. So from a vendor's standpoint, uh, you know, the vendor's goal was primarily just give me one standard to write to that works everywhere I need to use my devices. And the FTP standard has clearly met that objective. Device manufacturers can create a driver that we call a DTM in the FTP terminology. It's called a DTM. That's the driver that they'll write. And it'll work anywhere that an FTP application exists. There's no concern about interoperability. And yet they have all the advantage of being able to differentiate themselves. The standard doesn't restrict them in what appears in that driver. And you will see that, that you can get some very sophisticated drivers that have automatic wizards in them to help you configure devices, that have diagnostic tools that tell you you've got a problem developing before you even had a clue that something was going wrong. These DTMs can be extremely sophisticated, and that's all driven by that device manufacturer. So one of the great things about the FTP standard is it lets the device manufacturer, who knows about all the intelligence in their device, be able to communicate that to you as the end user in a very friendly way by using the FTP standard. In the past, you didn't have that capability. The intelligence was sort of left in the device, and you knew it was there, but you never really seemed to get full advantage of it. Now with the FTP standard, the device manufacturers can give you all that data. So there's over 90 companies that support this standard. And I think if you just glance at all the logos up there, you'll probably see all of your favorite suppliers. So this event is put on by the sponsors that you saw earlier who are members of the FTP organization that wanted to have the chance to make sure you understood what they do with the standard and how you can take advantage of that in your facility. So all these companies are members of the FTP organization. This is really only our only funding vehicle for the entire operation of the nonprofit side of our business. That's how we get the money to fund the activities that we do uh, is through these members of the FTP. So from our perspective, the FTP standard really should be the platform of choice for device integration. We don't have a competing standard out there. There's no sense in this industry that you need to build multiple versions of FTP-like standards so that the, the end users have a choice. With all of the manufacturers cooperating on the FTP standard, nearly every feature that they wanted to see incorporated in the standard is already in there or is planned for future releases in the standard. So there's not a sense of competition like you might have, let's say, at the network level between different standards. At the FTP level, the level above that, we've pretty much got everything that the, the manufacturers and end users are looking for. So our timeline is um, fairly long now in the organization. Uh, the, the original activity can be traced back into the 1997-98 time frame when a group of vendors got together and said there's got to be a better way of doing this than the way we're doing it back then. Uh, those conversations moved forward. The initial standard was developed. And then just in uh, the start of uh, 2009, just at the beginning of that year, the standard was accepted by the IEC organization. In fact, it had the unique honor of being unanimously voted in. There were no dissenting votes worldwide on the adoption of the IEC standard. That's pretty unusual. But I think it speaks volumes about all the work that had gone into preparing the standard and the fact that so many manufacturers were behind this standard to get it done in the industry. So we're 
We move on now, and we just released a new version of the standard this past year. We call that FDP2. We won't spend a lot of time on that today per se, because as we said, even when we release new versions of the standard, we make sure it's always backwards compatible. So when you hear FDP2, just think more features, more capabilities are in that new version. So let's talk a little bit about the, the basics of the standard, get you into some of the terminology that will help you then through the rest of the day. This will be pretty lightweight stuff. No engineering talk, no equations, no notes have to be taken per se other than a few key terms. But I think this will help you a lot if you've never seen the standard before. So, you know, we've got kind of a familiar problem, and the analogy in today's marketplace is the whole issue of apps with smartphones. You know, if you've got your smartphone, you've already realized that now with three, maybe four platforms out there, that the apps that are for a particular phone aren't available on the new phone that you got if you change platforms. So now you have to give up what you loved on that particular thing, and we were just having this conversation before. If you're a BlackBerry user, and then you move to Android operating system, you probably really miss your eBuzz mail application on your BlackBerry, right? Or if you move from uh, Apple to the uh, to Android, then you probably miss the nice integrated mail application on your iPhone. Always something is wrong. You can never move those things back from one to another. So wouldn't it really be nice if you had a standard in the industry that said, we really don't care which smartphone you have. We'll create the standard that any app will work on any smartphone, regardless of its platform, regardless of who made it. Okay, so you get that analogy. So if those could all be delivered that way, such that those apps ran on your phone, then wouldn't that be great for the industry? Because now you'd have the ultimate in competition. If you love the email app on your BlackBerry, you have no barrier then to transition to Android because you know your BlackBerry email app is going to run there. Or maybe you'll even find a better one. But at least you have that transportability. And those guys that write the apps, think of them. The guy that wrote the B Berry Buzz app, imagine the work he's got to go through or they've got to go through now to create the same app for the Android system. It's like starting over. And you've got to market it separately and so on and so forth. It's a nightmare. That's the way it used to be in the industrial automation marketplace. It was a nightmare if you were a device manufacturer and you wanted to cover the market in a very wide scope. So the FDP concept is... We create these things called DTMs. The device manufacturers create a DTM, which is essentially the app, if you want to think of it that way, the app that runs on all smartphones. Of course, in our industry, it's not smartphones. It's PLCs, ETSs, asset management systems, and so on. So this DTM can run on any host system that supports the FDP standard. It doesn't matter what the application is. It doesn't matter what it's capable of. It doesn't matter what the scope of the system is. It'll simply work. So we've got in the FDP terminology just two major terms that you have to know. One is called the frame application, which is the higher level system. It can be the PLC. It can be the DCS. That part of the application is called the frame. And we think of it as the frame because that's where all those apps plug into, all the DTMs plug into is the frame. So it's the frame that collects all those DTMs and uses it for whatever the application is. And you can see on the FDP standard, what we really do as a standard, it seems kind of strange, but all our scope is is this orange line that you see around here. We define how this device, the DTM, that was written by some device manufacturer, how that particular DTM can talk with this frame application that you see around the perimeter. So DTM comes from the device manufacturer, and the frame comes from the higher level system functionality, the DCS, PLCs, asset management, calibration management, whatever it is, system that wants to talk with those devices. Okay, DTM by the device, frame by the higher level guy. 
So the frame can host many different DTMs in it. In fact, there's no limit. We now have many applications that we refer to as mega sites, where there are tens of thousands of devices that are supported by DTMs. So a given ECS could literally have tens of thousands of DTMs loaded in it to manage its complete environment. So there's no limit to how many DTMs a frame application can take. Um, and you see here, and Juan will talk about this in a little bit also, that there's a tree on the side of the frame application. And every frame application you see will have this tree that allows you to navigate through the assets, through the hierarchy of everything that's in your plant or facility. So you can click through and see all the different devices, all the different networks, all the gateways, and so on. And when you click on a particular device, it shows up in that area of the frame that I showed a minute ago where the DTM is represented. Then the DTM, remember this is the driver or the app, if you will, for the actual device. So if it's a flow meter, if it's a gateway, if it's a pressure transducer, if it's an I.O. point, whatever it is, there's a DTM that represents that particular device. It could be something as simple as a photo eye that has a DTM in it. Or the DTM represents the device it's responsible for all the rich graphical content that you get to see for that device. So all the wizards, all the historical plots, all the diagnostic capabilities and so on, all exist within that DTM. So it's the responsibility of the device manufacturer to give you the most full feature DTM that you need for your application. These things really are pretty neat now. You know, if you configure a, let's say, an AC drive with one of these DTMs, the wizards that are in those DTMs are amazing. They'll walk you through the type of application that you're running. You know, they'll, you know, step you all the way through it and do the majority of the configuration of your drive for you, which is pretty significant. These intelligent devices now are thousands of parameters that often have to be set. Take something like a mass Coriolis flow meter, and you've got thousands of parameters that you could potentially fool around with. The wizards in the DTM set the majority of those for you. They walk you through your application, what you're trying to do, and so on, and they'll set it up for you. Another way of looking at this, and you'll see this demonstrated, is networks. Networks in themselves can have DTMs to monitor the health of the network. So now if a terminating resistor goes missing on one of your networks somewhere, the DTM will actually tell you that, the one that's monitoring that network. It'll tell you, hey, you just lost a terminating resistor. In the past, that might have taken you an hour to figure out that somebody knocked off a terminating resistor or one fell out when somebody was maintaining a cab there. Now it just pops up instantly on the DTM and says, hey, put the terminating resistor back in. So that's the features of the DTM. And remember, those are always supplied by the manufacturer. Okay, so when you're looking at a particular manufacturer's device, one of the things you want to also see is show me what you've all got built into your DTM because much of the intelligence of that device is reflected in that DTM. So here's a few features about DTMs. Uh, we do maintain a style guide that tries to keep all the DTMs at least having the menus in the same places and warning boxes popping up the same way so that every manufacturer doesn't present you a completely different look and feel. So because of that, we can say here's some, some common features. So first of all, the DTM itself is protocol independent. Okay, so the device DTM doesn't really care per se what protocol the device is actually running on. This allows a device manufacturer to make the same device for Heart, for FF, for Profibus, for example, and use the same DTM to represent the device. And the reason they can do that is because the network itself is represented by a different DTM that handles the interface from the device to the network. Okay, so the device DTM is protocol independent. It has standard menu bars for navigation, diagnostics, statuses down on the bottom, and so on. And you'll see that as you look at the various DTMs today in the demo area. Let me show you a few quick screen examples because we often find when 
the terminology is new and the concepts are new, a few pictures go a long way. And I think Juan's got a few good pictures teed up for you as well. And then you'll see them live as you're looking in the demo area. So here's a typical advanced configuration. This is where you can pick the kind of tank you're calibrating a device to or you're using that, that you're putting the device in its application. And it'll walk you through what all has to be set up. Here's alarm management, which is probably one of the most popular topics these days uh, when we go around and do the demonstrations of what FTP is capable of, is show me about alarming, uh, diagnostics, those kinds of information, because that's where many people struggle in keeping their facility running properly, is getting enough information ahead of time, or when something finally does fail, get them the right information on a timely basis to get things back up and running. And many of the DTMs now offer fantastic diagnostic capabilities. Here's an example of network diagnostics where you can see it's actually showing the health of the network. So you can at any time look at what the network's doing and then the DTM itself will tell you when there's a problem with the network. Anybody here use a Foundation Field Bus in their facility? Nobody's Foundation Field Bus. Okay. I was going to say about foundation field bus is you can put redundant power supplies on foundation field bus. So if you lose one of your supplies, your network doesn't go down, the other supply kicks in. In today's environment, without these kind of DTMs, most people will lose the primary power supply on their FF network. It'll switch over seamlessly to the backup supply. Life is great in the plant. It went on without a hiccup until the day that the backup supply failed because nobody knew that the primary supply was offline. And so it just goes right along until finally the backup fails. Well, the DTM in this case will tell you you've lost a power supply on this particular network set. So those are the kind of things people enjoy for diagnostics at the network level. Um, these symbols down here are standardized symbols to indicate the health of a particular application of a DTM. It'll tell you the health through symbology. Device diagnostics, um, anybody doing partial stroke tests here, valves, partial stroke tests, are done right within the DTM. It's all managed through the DTM itself. So you don't now have to have separate wizards, separate software tools. The people, the device manufacturers for valves, whether it's the actuators or complete valve and actuators, have almost all of their partial stroke stuff put into the DTM. So you can do it all in the same environment. You can monitor the trends and so on, and it can do the alarming for you if there's a problem on the PSD. On the communication side of things, remember I said that FTP is not another communications network. We don't do anything actively uh, in the communication network area other than work with all the other standards organizations that develop networks. So as things progress, we're always working with them to make sure that their network is fully compatible with the FTP standard. So a more recent example would be wireless heart. If you've taken wireless heart on, for example, that standard has come up in the last year and a half. We work with the heart organization to make sure that that works seamlessly on the FTP standard. Or you might be looking at one of the other wireless standards. Chances are we're talking with that, those network organizations to make sure they're compatible. So how do we do that? Uh, first of all, we're protocol independent. The standard was brilliantly written to realize that no matter how many standards, how many networks we could have communicated with in the beginning, that was going to change over time. And it almost seems like, especially from an ethernet standard, there's a new ethernet standard announced every six months or every year for the industry. And it would be hard for us to keep re-releasing our standard to say, oh, now we've got another network that we have to incorporate. So we actually wrote the standard so that it was protocol independent, completely independent of the network. In fact, a device manufacturer or a system manufacturer could put their own proprietary protocol on the standard. So if they've got a legacy system that they use for maintaining devices or some old network from a legacy PLC or DCS system, they can even support that on the standard as well. 
We do not restrict that. So how do we do that? Well, first we can do these point-to-point uh, -point type communication where we can communicate from the PLC directly to a device. So this can be used in uh, commissioning. So you could sit at a workstation and commission a device. You could take your notebook out in the field, commission a device out in the field if you're doing some replacement of devices. You can do maintenance in the field, so you can plug in directly to the device and say, I'm going to exercise this device, take a look at its intelligent information and see what I can figure out. Um, or you can sit and do those diagnostics in the control room as well. Many people adopt the FDP standard just to get that remote diagnostic capability so that they can sit in the control room before walking you know, a multi-hectare plant just to get to a device that they think might be causing a problem now you can just bring it up in the control room and at least do some early diagnostics. Am I on the right track? So you can plug in directly to the notebook computer with a protocol converter and talk directly to those devices with the FDP standard. Similarly, you can do it through the network. So the FDP standard not only talks to every network that's out there in the industry, but we can talk through every network that's out there in the industry. So we can start at the top with the PC simply connected, for example, to an Ethernet network, have a gateway sitting here that's converting it to some intermediate network. Pick a network. It could be FF or something like that. Um, comes down to a PLC later in the architecture and then finally ends up at some other network level like a heart type network. We can talk through all those networks to get down to the end device, to do the asset management, to do the configuration, calibration, commissioning type activity that's expected. So we do not restrict that, and it's unique to our capability to go through all those individual networks. Those network organizations don't do that. It's the FDP standard that enables the ability to peer through those networks to stack them and talk right through them. So you can plug anywhere into that architecture and get access to those devices. Um, DTMs and frames are widely available in the marketplace. It was funny, when I started realizing what the FDP standard was, I worked for Rockwell at the time. And when we would stand in trade shows as part of the FDP display, we'd spend most of our time explaining to people what is the FDP standard and what's coming and what does it mean to you. Now the conversations have completely flipped. Now people will say, well, I'm looking for a DTM for this kind of device. Who makes it? Okay, so the DTMs are widely available in the marketplace now. Um, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of DTMs that are out there. We support over 4,000 devices with DTMs today, and that's just DTMs that we've certified. So there's very high device support out in the marketplace for the individual devices. Then the other side of the application, the frame, the higher level system side, there's dozens of those as well, built into the PLCs, built into the DCSs, built into asset management tools, built into calibration tools. You'll find frame applications all over the place that use the FDP standard. Sometimes you may not even be aware it's there. You might already be using the FDP standard and you're watching this presentation and suddenly realize that, hey, I have that already in my application. You didn't even know it. So it's out there. It's very pervasive now. You can find almost any solution you're looking for that is FDP enabled. Um, if you are having troubles finding particular devices of a certain type or a certain capability, you can look at our website, uh, fdpgroup.org, and there is a list of all the certified DTMs out there and frames out there. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, you can just always drop us an email and we'll try to search through our members to find the, the type of device or the type of application or the type of service that you're looking for. So FDP works well both in greenfield and brownfield type facilities. We see pretty equal application now. Part of the advantage is it works with almost any network that's been deployed in a facility, so you can pretty easily add FDP on top of most installations without any major rework of those applications, or you can build from the ground up using the FDP standard. 
So just a couple of uh, concluding thoughts before we open it up for uh, any questions you might have is first, user requirements. So you know what we think we've met well with the FDP standard and we continue to monitor and make better our capabilities to do that is first of all from a end user perspective is give you the opportunity to choose best in class devices that you're not tied to a given vendor to develop your entire application from you. You can be out in the marketplace and find unique capabilities and buy from those vendors. Um, you've got your investment protection. FDP systems that were put in six, seven, eight years ago, when the new FDP standards start showing up in the new products, it'll be backwards compatible with everything that was installed, which means you don't have to go to your vendors and say, quick, I need all new DTMs because I just got this new FDP2 frame application in. You can use the old DTMs that you're already using in that new FDP frame. So you've got that backwards compatibility that protects your investment. You get the plant-wide data access, this ability to sit anywhere in that network and peer through all the layers of your networks that are in your facility and talk directly with the end devices no matter where you are is an extraordinarily powerful tool. Whether it's advanced diagnostics so that you're getting information before something fails or whether you have to do some quick triage before you send any of your techs out into the field to start opening things up. You can sit there at the FDP application and say, let me just check a few key spots here and see if I can narrow this down to where a problem might be. You can look at the health of the network itself to see if it's that. So you've got this ability to sit anywhere in that architecture and get access. And again, all independent of suppliers that are involved in that architecture. In fact, some people will start just by going and getting an asset management application on an FDP and adding that on top of an otherwise non-FDP based system just to start getting that remote uh, system wide access. And then ease of use for the entire life cycle. You can completely um, configure your plant on an FDP frame application with no devices present. You could sit on your PC reconfigure everything so that when you start commissioning devices and you start plugging them into the network, you can automatically load the parameters to those devices as they come up in line in your architecture. And that carries through all the way to the end of calibration, maintenance, decommissioning, and so on. That data is still there, still available. So if you have to swap devices, update devices, you've got the information you need sitting there in the DTM for those particular devices. 